be it the regulatory landscape or the sheer size of the economy or just the general changing political dynamics, China clearly runs on a different playbook. If you factor it all in, China is one of the world's most dynamic and complex places to do business. As we head through post-recovery of COVID, I wanted to gather insights from our consultants in our China offices to uncover the current dynamics and leaderships needed to steer foreign companies towards success in China. Hai Long, I'd like to ask you, um, what kind of major hurdles are you seeing on the ground for foreign companies in terms of doing business in China today? Many multinational companies have an added caution uh, because of the global political environment reality. Uh, so when it comes to major investment decisions, uh, that process seems to start taking longer. Uh, so that is certainly one observation. But on the other hand, uh, we cannot ignore the sheer size of the Chinese economy, and it will become a further a powerhouse for the world economy. And the market size is huge. So that two factors putting together, uh, yeah. you know, will still be very attractive to any multinational companies. And Grace, coming out of post-COVID and how quickly China's recovered, what are the challenges for foreign companies that want to access China's consumer market? Yeah, I think there's uh, complexity and ambiguity based upon the observation that we have uh, on the ground. So it seems that all the multinational companies of the consumer-faced industries, they are reviewing and re- evaluating the role of the China market to play in their overall global strategy. And during such kind of exercise of re-evaluation, some of deciding whether it makes more sense for them to further invest in China in a way that be more aggressive. Some they are considering whether it be making more sense for them to divest of their China arm to give the China more space and autonomy to grow in the market. So we are observing those kind of different range of activities and it's definitely interesting for us to keep on watching. Ed, in the technology space, we've seen a lot of noise in the macroeconomic environment. Yet China um, and technology are, are, are growing both at a rapid pace. What do you see the main challenges for uh, overseas listed companies that want to be active um, in the technology space in China? The major challenge is uh, there is uh, a uh, heightened sensitivity and awareness uh, for the Chinese entities uh, to exert control over both technology and uh, data assets, uh, which has never been there before. So uh, you will start to hear the word stranglehold um, much more than before. So uh, today, I would say companies on both sides are, are much more conscious about uh, taking control uh, and taking protection of uh, uh, their proprietary technology as well as data assets. So this is something we're affecting every decision uh, on uh, the business, business front. I think technology was one of the areas in previous years where we saw a lot of talent flow between China and overseas markets. A lot of early stage Chinese went overseas to learn technology and then came back. And and then a lot of U.S. companies or foreign companies tried new technology in China. I mean, how do you see the changes affect that flow of talent? The flow of talent has slowed down. There there is uh, much more restriction both from uh, the uh, immigration, from political and from psychological uh, aspects. Uh, Aside from the practical restrictions uh, issued by government, um, the uh, talents on both sides are much more conscious about uh, the uh, impact on their own career and uh, sometimes even from a national security perspective. So this has slowed down <clears throat> the uh, uh, talent flow by both sides uh, t- tremendously. So both sides will probably need to look internally more to spend more on developing talent rather than just trying to attack talent externally. Definitely, that, that is a general trend. And uh, in the meantime, uh, there will be areas where China is still looking to US or EU uh, for talents. So uh, they, they just need to come up with uh, much uh, more creative uh, solutions. Um, for example, uh, setting up overseas uh, labs or entities instead of uh, bringing people back. 
Hailong, in the industrial space, China um, mm -hmm. is very clear in terms of setting out its industrial goals every five years, 10 years. When you look at um, what they've been saying about the next round of plans around you know, their industrial foundations and supply chains um, and building of those supply chains, um, what are the implications for foreign companies in those sectors? There will be increased uh, competition. Local Chinese uh, companies, including the SOEs, over the years have become uh, much more competitive and more technologically advanced. Uh, that is number one. Number two, there is a positive side of that. Compared with other smaller economies, China would offer a more complete supply chain, uh, which is vital for any industrial economies. On the one hand, there will be growing competition, but on the other hand, uh, do not underestimate the attractiveness of the Chinese uh, market. Uh, by that, I mean the better uh, complete uh, supply chain that is available locally, uh, which is a huge competitive advantage. When we talk about competitive advantage in the consumer market, Grace, China has a huge competitive advantage, especially even during COVID, you know, just the size and scope uh, of population, large cities, uh, the average spend. I mean, what have you seen in terms of how that has affected how foreign companies who want to still sell in China um, in terms of their talent? and the people they, they hire to help them access and, and develop those markets better? Yeah, I probably would like to take one step back you know, before I answer this question in the view of the consumer-faced companies, because what we have observed, particularly in a post-COVID-19, there is what we call co-occurrence of both the consumption upgrading and also people's mindset shifting from like expensive means good quality uh, to like value for money. Mm -hmm. So that actually creates a lot of implications to how those multinational companies need to conquer both the market share and the mind share in a way that look at, for example, the sophistication of the consumers in this market. And also in terms of that shifting to experience-oriented and service-oriented consumption. So that is number one. Number two is regarding to the technology and also those kind of efforts to capture in the China market, allowing those lower entry barrier of those consumer-fed startups you know, to build the business model that was the high-quality offering but with low price. That has a huge competitive advantage. And then if you look up to those getting more matured you know, platform native digital players, they actually allow those kind of consolidated bargaining power among consumers uh, to penetrate further into those geographic areas. In the past, it's so challenging for those multinational companies to penetrate into. Um, so in that regard, I think as for multinational companies to play and win further the market, it's very important to reconsider saying where they invest to be played and also how they are able to position themselves strong in those kind of new categories and new opportunities of growth. And, and that need them to bring those talent leadership that is required for such kind of challenges and opportunities as well. I think in the consumer market, we've seen a lot of the foreign multinationals have come to China and initially at least very much relied on brand power and, and sort of um, the brand sells itself to a certain extent, but we're seeing China's developing its own tastes, its own styles, um, its own levels of sophistication. So presumably the outcome of that then is that for multinationals to continue to be more successful is to understand how to adapt to the local market, which then leads to the question of local talent. I think in technology, we see that a lot, Ed, already. Technology used to be led um, by the overseas markets. Now um, it's being led very much by China. How is that shift playing out in terms of talent in technology? So in, in terms of talent, uh, uh, the uh uh, the sequence of uh, interest in the past uh, always started to from the sales and marketing front. So 
China is first and foremost a uh, market for most of the uh, technology company uh, from the West. And gradually, <clears throat> the emphasis is focusing on more manufacturing logistics and later on to more core technology R&D. So uh, that trend uh, will continue. We are seeing uh, companies are moving in waves. For example, uh, the first to come are the largest, the Fortune 500 uh, of the worlds. Later on, the uh, Russell 2000 of the worlds and even start to see startups coming to China. They are all following this flow. So uh, this pattern will still continue. But uh, because of... Uh, the implication from COVID, especially the political and geopolitical angle, you start to see some interesting nuances in uh, the diversification of uh, talents, especially in the area of compliance and the risk and control. We are uh, actually started to uh, experience a lot of uh, demand and requests actually from both sides of uh, hiring talents. Uh, either uh, it can take a different uh, shape and form, but uh, it all deals with uh, the domestic or uh, the indigenous uh, legal environment. For example, uh, the Chinese tech companies are trying to hire uh, uh, talents who are familiar with the legal environment, the risk uh, management uh, uh, aspect uh, in EU and the US and vice versa. And Hailong, when we look in the industrial space, um, where companies are involved in long-term projects, heavy capital expenditure, often still working in a joint venture type model, and how do you see finding talent um, who is still willing to go in these sort of much longer, more traditional um, forms of industry? Compared with uh, the consumer industry and especially the tech technical industry, I think uh, in that the industrial world uh, is much more dependent on capex capital investment, and then the the, fall, the, the the manufacturing and the sales process after that. So, in comparison, uh, the rhythm tends to be somewhat smaller, uh, slower. And, um, you know, the decision process takes a little longer. It's, on the surface, it looks as if the industry is not as dynamic as the IT industry, but it is indeed stable. When it comes to people, given the current political and geopolitical reality, business leaders need to make decisions uh, still in such an environment. Now, coming to China, you need these talents, you need these local senior executives who can not only see the challenge here in China for their own company, but also can find solutions. It's not enough just to see the, uh, the challenges because back in the headquarters, uh, people see exactly the same. They see a lot of challenges and, uh, and ambiguities. Uh, they need you to propose solutions. Uh, but then when you have a solution in mind, the next challenge is that you need to be able to persuade the, the executives in the headquarters uh, to accept uh, your solution. And so effective communication has become very, very critical. And that's number one. Number two, you know, the understanding of the local market, the local culture, the local economy, as well as a deep insight in how the Western uh, multinational companies work and the internal headquarters decision making process and that is also a very critical factor uh, so we do see that uh, the, 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 the 60s 70s generation there's two generations of people call them the high ways typically and they, they, they have worked in multinational companies overseas and then they were sent back to china so they, they also gathered plenty of insights in the Chinese economy and the market. Uh, so you can see the trend is that they start to take increasingly a, a more important role in multinational company uh, operations here. I think we, we talk about it a lot as a firm, you know, the, the balance when we're assessing individuals and organizations between the need for a technical skill set and, and actual cultural fit. And it's always a balance between the two. At certain jobs, you actually have to absolutely have a technical competency to do. Um, and it doesn't matter how nice a person you are and how well you fit in. If you can't do the job, the job doesn't get done. Versus those roles where the technical competency might not be as important because there are those who can do it. But what's important is being able to get the message across about why a particular action or a particular step needs to be taken. 
And, and I feel that in China, there's a lot of tension between those two sort of balances um, in, in the work we do these days. And, and uh, Ed, in the, in the tech space, I know this is really, really prevalent. And as you said, now people needing to understand the compliance risks, the legal risks, as much as the technology. You know, it's not just enough that you know how to write a program or how you collect the data, but then it's how you want to use the data. You need to understand how to explain to someone, maybe in a different country, 10,000 miles away, that has totally different data privacy laws. Definitely. So uh, the uh, critical successful factor for a, uh, uh, a senior leader for any MNC in China, it used to be more drive for results. Um, uh, I mean, David, in your work, get things done and also in communication. But today, on top of this, uh, the ability to really think um, on your feet, uh, taking what, what I coined as an outside in approach. Uh, in terms of uh, setting strategy, have become even more important uh, compared with before. Previously, you can be a top-notch uh, country head if you can uh, do a great job uh, in terms of implementing the corporate strategies uh, and uh, getting the results. But these days, uh, this is no longer uh, uh, possible because as uh, Grace mentioned, the, the uh, outside environment has changed so much. Uh, I mean, what happened uh, during and after COVID-19 is nothing less than uh, tectonic plate changes. Yeah, indeed, conversation I'm having with the senior executives. Um, they are actually saying more and more that in the past, when track records experience plays the most important role, now it's actually urging them as a leader to, pick, you know, to enhance, improve the learning agility because New things, new model, new concepts, ideas definitely occur more frequently and uh, urging them to be able to pick and take those kind of new concepts and new models and put that into their business operation and be able to scale those kind of innovation. So such kind of competency is really critical to them. Yeah. I spend a lot of my time in the industrial sector talking to companies about people and it's interesting, people are to a certain extent, are less worried about what people did in the past and more focused on what they can do in the future. Indeed. But, you know, and high long in industrial, you and I work closely on many things. When no one knows what the future looks like, then no one's done it, right? So how do we, how do we help companies, especially overseas companies in China, bridge that gap? We, we talk about the big data, uh, digitization, the cloud computing, AI, and all this tech, uh, you know, Technology has enabled all these changes, and it uh, it potentially has a, a huge impact on the future of uh, traditional industries. Um, so, uh, be it with or without uh, COVID, uh, I think this is the new reality. And uh, certain uh, industries like consumer uh, retail and uh, logistics, uh, you know, they have adapted to this environment very well. The technologies has already brought a huge uh, fundamental changes and making the whole thing much more effective. But when it comes to some of the traditional industries, typically the, the, the oil and gas, the chemicals, the mining industry, uh, and many others as well, actually, um, I think people are still sort of exploring. We see this coming. Uh, we see it both as a threat and as an opportunity. And uh, if we don't do anything, someone else may get there and unseat us. Uh, so there is a, a great deal amount of uh, anxiety and willingness to invest. But I think overall, the reality is many uh, industries, companies are still sort of um, exploring this. Uh, and some may in, end up paying the study fees rather than having uh, the, the, the fundamental results uh, they, they, they that they are giving them a quantum leap uh, for the future. Uh, that's just the reality. Uh, you know, coming to China uh, is the same thing. Uh, and I would tend to think that um, uh, the local Chinese companies are very often more flexible and willing to take that approach. Uh, and let's try and see. Now, it, for multinational companies, especially if you're listed on the stock market, uh, never forget that you have a lot of pressure from the investment arena as well. So any decisions you make may have a consequence. So I think that would ex indeed extend the decision-making process. 
for many multinational companies. I'm glad you brought up the listed company investors pressure scenario, because one of the things that we've seen a lot of in the last 18 months globally and also within Asia Pacific, and I'd love to get your views on, is the impact of of, of, uh, both ESG initiatives um, and also uh, DNI. Ed, how do we see DNI playing out or, or ESG in the tech space in China? Well, they definitely play a role. I mean, ESG, <clears throat> interestingly, is not only something uh, the Western companies are championing, but uh, uh, it was also being uh, propelled and uh, set, uh, put up by the Chinese uh, government's initiatives. So, so this is uh, very much in everyday conversation. Uh, but uh, that said, uh, uh, when we are... Uh, Coming to the uh, actual situation of uh, leadership succession or leadership replacement, we are still seeing, uh, in terms of top of agenda, uh, in, in terms of strategy setting, um, finding sustainable growth opportunities, uh, dealing with changes um, uh, on a broader plan rather than specifically for DNI or ESG at the moment. Um, but uh, I do want to circle back, David, uh, and just edit a, a few more comments regarding the earlier uh, conversation, passing comment regarding the learning agility, uh, or in other words, growth mindset. While Hailong is absolutely right, there are many companies still uh, taking a, a look and see attitude toward um, uh, people with learning agility, but less of uh, kind of uh, track record. I'm also seeing uh, some of the largest international uh, companies uh, who is willing to actually take a plunge into this. Uh, in some of our recent assignments, uh, you know, with company with a multi-billion dollar uh, business in China, uh, I mean, these uh, country head positions used to go to people with 25 or 30 years of experience, but they actually are t- willing to take a leap of uh, faith to give those positions to people with less than 20 years of experience, but who demonstrate much higher uh, what our client called a growth mindset in the learning agility. I think we definitely would see that more in the tech space. I think in the industrial space where the nature of the businesses, especially in, in some of the areas we work in, in energy, um, utilities, those areas, the, the, the reality is however much they want to transform themselves, they also need experience of running those businesses because they're so critical. Um, Grace, I know DNI in the consumer space is front and center for a lot of multinationals. But uh, how, how do you see DNI in, in China in particular, and how um, large multinationals might look at those issues? So our observation is that even talking about DNI is more correlated with strategy. For example, we look at all those latest placement of those net executive director or those advisors to those global consumer companies. You know, as uh, in you know, the surface, you look at this uh, more kind of female uh, join that board. But if you dive deeper into the ration behind, it's actually closely correlated to their strategy. They want to capture the opportunities that occur with this you know, younger generation, direct to consumer. I think that's really interesting because one of the things that people forget about diversity or, 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 or get lost is actually age. And it's one of the challenges in, in Asia we see that from an age perspective, if your average board director is in their 60s, well, then you're looking at someone who's been working for 40 years, there will just be fewer female candidates. But if you're willing to, as Ed said in the tech space, for example, look at people who've got less experience, then at that group of people who've only got maybe 15 or 20 years of experience, then it's much more balanced from a gender perspective. So one of, one of the things we talk a lot about with clients is about think out of the box from an age perspective um, and you'll get much more diversity but but how long i know in in industrial it's it's a little bit more slow moving but the esg side is very rapidly advancing in industrial indeed indeed david um uh, i i think in the searches that we conduct uh we do have an increasing number of such assignments uh traditional manufacturing industrial businesses uh increasingly uh, uh, look for talents in this space. Um, I would say apart from governance, uh, you know, when they look for talents, uh, it's especially uh, in the Chinese market, uh, especially in the te- technical area that Ed is in, I, I think uh, you know, unquestionable integrity and compliance uh, has becoming 
increasingly important, and it has been a challenge for multinational companies here in China uh, anyway over the last 20 years or so. One final question to each of you. So, Ed, what's the one thing that you've really learned over the last 18 months that you think would be really um, important for clients to understand? So my, my one lesson or one advice to uh, uh, the multinational company who are contempl uh, contemplating uh, uh, to do business better in China is uh, being very upfront and transparent about the complicity that the company is facing. Uh, and also demonstrate this openness uh, to uh, taking an outside approach to really uh, send a feeder out, understanding the situation uh, on the ground in China in terms of formulating strategies and driving uh, plans. So this transparency, this uh, upfrontness will be the single largest factor that, that attracting uh, talents. Grace, in, in the consumer sector, what would be the one takeaway lesson you've learned that you've seen um, from your clients that you would share with, with, with other clients? Yeah, I think it's the remain alternatives and stay focused in the meantime, bold enough to make trade-off option decision. Hi Long, in the industrial space, what's the one key thing that you would like to pass on to clients? The advice is before you uh, come to China, uh, before you uh, expand further in China, seeing all the challenges, ask yourself, what do you bring to the China? Is the product, is the, the capital, uh, you know, the technology or what? And then on that basis, how do you want to play? Joint ventures uh, by yourself, you know, these are all the options. Uh, and then we really need somebody who is an expert uh, playing that bridging role between the West and the East. Uh, they know the local uh, nuances very, very well. They have all the insights uh, and the necessary uh, knowledge for how, how the decisions are made here. But then on the other hand, they can be very, very effective back in the headquarters. Uh, so finding that somebody uh, is a tall order. Uh, and that's what we are here to do, to help. Thank you, everyone. Thank you very much for your insights and uh, look forward to seeing you all soon. Thank you. Thank you.